uh, your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to this fact? <laughs> All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. <laughs> he said, your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to this fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. This is especially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, by Jove, I'm being humble. <laughs> you know, you're saying to yourself, bless God, I'm finally accomplishing this thing. And almost immediately pride, pride at his own humility, will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt to smother this new form of pride, and so on, through as many stages as you please. You see, he's humble. Alert him to this. All right, now he becomes proud. Have him endeavor to smush that pride. Now he's proud that he's endeavoring to smush this first occurrence of pride in his life. Now he recognizes that he's proud over the first attempt of trying to conquer that pride. And so, make him proud over that. He said, so, however many stages as you please, keep him going through those stages of recognizing the virtues that he has. Uh, by the way, what I'm going to entitle the, this message tonight, with the time that I have left here, is humility as forgetfulness. And really, you could say just about all the virtues as that, that they do not become virtues until they are unconscious virtues. I mean, is there any such thing as, um, in, in this sense, in the sense in which we're dealing with it here, a striving after humility? Because what's going to happen? How can a person ever strive to be humble? I mean, as soon as you strive to be humble, then you have accomplished humility, and you'll be grateful and proud of the fact that you have striven with an accomplishment as a result. Humility as forgetfulness. And we could, as we say here in the very top of page 63, all virtues, all virtues as virtues of forgetfulness. That, in other words, that we accomplish something, that we did it without even realizing that we did it. That's where he will get in one, two, three, four, paragraph four, which is the D point here. Uh, don't try this too long for fear you awake his sense of humor and proportion. Uh, in which case he will merely laugh at you and go to bed, as we just did with ourselves there. Go through as many stages as you please, but not for too long, because he'll end up being humorous. He'll say, well, I'm being proud of everything and then being uh, proud of the conquering of the pride that conquered the pride that conquered the pride of the first step of humility. And he said pretty soon he'll catch on and he'll simply laugh at you and go to bed. I guess what he's saying there is maybe that's one way to overcome a lot of temptation, just go to bed. That's really true. Instead of sitting there and fighting and wrestling and just go to bed. Because the theme here is just forgetfulness. Just forget about it. It won't be a temptation and then it won't be a virtue that you can chalk up somewhere. Just forget about it. But there are other profitable ways of fixing his attention on the virtue of humility. By this virtue, as by all the others, our enemy wants to turn the man's attention away from self to him and to the man's neighbors. <coughs> all the abjection and self-hatred are designed in the long run solely for this end. Unless they attain this end, they do us little harm. And they may even do us good if they keep the man concerned with himself. And above all, if self-contempt can be made a starting point for contempt of other selves, and thus for gloom, cynicism, and cruelty. I could comment on that paragraph, but I want to keep going. Uh, you must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. Okay, the true end of it. If, if the true end or the true purpose, the true result, I guess would be a better term, of humility is concealed from us, then the starting point is probably also equally vague in our mind. Let us therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, there's the true end in humility, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion, of his own talents and character. 
Let's read a little more and then you'll probably catch the flavor of what he's saying and how he's saying it. He says, like, for instance, some talents I gather he really has. Fix his, fix in his mind the idea that humility consists in trying to believe those talents to be less valuable than he believes them to be. I think oftentimes that's kind of where we end up mentally with this business of humility. Is we, we think that we have something, or we think that we are something, but then we think that we are supposed to think less than we truly think about ourselves. The word to think other than we think for, let's say, the talents or of the talents that we have. No doubt they are, in fact, less valuable than he believes. But that's not the point. Uh, the great thing is to make him value an opinion for some quality other than truth. You see, in other words, if you've got talents that are truly talents and you try to tell yourself those aren't talents, you're simply deceiving yourself. He says, therefore, what we want is this man to value an opinion for some quality other than truth. The opinion that you value, where you uh, devalue talents that really are valuable, that truly are valuable, if you're trying to devalue those, that's not true. Those are valuable talents. And so now we have him involved in an opinion that's based on deceit. Uh, thus introducing an element of dishonesty and make-believe into the heart of what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. Now here's a good example, if you want an example of what he means. By this method, thousands of humans have been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe they are ugly and clever men trying to believe they are fools. You see what he's saying? A lot of people are taught this is what humility is, is it's trying to think less of yourself than you really are. And so you'll comment. Have you ever done this? You see it in the movies all the time. Someone comments, it's a pretty woman, you're pretty... Oh, I'm not. I'm really not. And they really are. And so that's not humility. That's a form of self-deceit. Really, the person ends up deceiving themselves. They call that humility, but their false form of humility is based on um, dishonesty and make-believe or a clever man trying to make himself believe that he's really a fool. But this, then, is humility. And since what they are trying to believe may, in some cases, be manifest nonsense, such as telling a beautiful woman that you're beautiful and she says, no, I'm ugly, well, that's nonsense. They cannot succeed in believing it, and we have the chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving on themselves in an effort to in achieve the impossible. Now, do you see what he's saying here? This is the best part of what we're discussing tonight. Go back with the woman who's, what does he say, the pretty woman. And you tell her that she's pretty, and she tells you, no, I'm not, I'm ugly. She thinks that's humility. All right, since what they are trying to believe is nonsense. In this case, it'd be nonsense. It's not true to life. It's make-believe. It's fiction, not fact. Since this is nonsense, she'll never be successful in believing it. Because you can't, you can't really believe something that's an obvious, factual lie. She can look in the mirror and know it's a lie to try to convince herself that she's not pretty. So, she'll never succeed in believing it. So... <laughs> We have the chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving on themselves. The whole thing of humility is not to think about yourself. But we're going to keep their minds on themselves in an effort to achieve what's impossible. Someone says you're pretty. The whole time you're trying to convince yourself you're ugly because you think that's humility and yet you look in the mirror and know that it's not true. And so tomorrow the whole cycle starts all over again. So you're a clever person. Someone tells you you're intelligent. You say, no, I'm ignorant. I'm a fool. I don't know anything. But that's really not true because your thought patterns the next day tell you that you're not a fool, that you are clever. And so you're trying to believe something that's really not true. And so what it goes back to then is what are we talking about with humility? Humility is not trying to tell yourself that you're not what you are. Because as soon as you do that, you're lying to yourself. That's not humility. So what Lewis wants us to do is, is maybe forget about all of the uh, pizzazz of the argument here and go back to, well, what is humility? Well, then he takes us back to, well, what is the end of humility? Self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. It's not a denial of fact or reality. 
itself forgetfulness. Of course, what we don't have really here is how, how do we achieve that, though? <laughs> how do you achieve self-forgetfulness? I think this is a very interesting thought that he has. I think this is probably the key to a lot of these virtues that we've studied earlier. Bottom of page 63 again. You must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. If you don't know the end, you probably don't know the starting point, you'll never make it there. If you don't know the starting point, if you don't know the starting point, if you don't know what it's all about, that what this, humility, all the virtues are all about is self-forgetfulness, if you don't know the starting point, uh, you'll never make it to the proper concluding point then. It's like a story I read one time of a world-class female runner from New York City, and she was scheduled to run. It's a true story. She was scheduled to run in a 10-kilometer race up in Connecticut. And so the morning of the race, the Saturday morning, she left her home in New York City following what she thought were the proper directions to the start of the race in upstate Connecticut. Well, she got lost on the way. She pulled into a filling station, and all she knew about the race was that it was upstate Connecticut and that it began in the parking lot of a shopping center. Well, the attendant there at the gas station said, well, there's a race right down the street around the corner, begins in the same location, must be the race. So she thanks the attendant at the gas station, hops in her car, takes off, relieved to get there just in time. Surprised to see not as many cars or runners as she was anticipating. She's a world-class female runner. And she runs up to the table and the race official, after she gives her name, is a little surprised to find such an illustrious runner in their race. And he still says, yes, you can run. Tag this number on. And she goes and jumps in line and the gun goes off and she takes off and wins easily. Uh, by four minutes, she beat even the nearest male only to find out it was the wrong race. It was the race of a lot of local farmers and people. That's why she beat even the fastest male by four minutes. So the point is, if you start at the wrong place and run the wrong race, you'll end up with some cheap prize then. She was a world-class runner that simply got in the wrong race because her directions were wrong. She failed to know where is the starting point. She got in the wrong race, wrong starting point. Same thing is going to be true here with humility. If we think, now, what humility is all about is having a low opinion of myself, and it's always a low opinion that you think is not deserved. You think it's a low opinion that's being forced upon you from above. But it's an undeserved low opinion because you know yourself. You live with yourself. You know you're better than that. But the Bible still says don't think of yourself that way, and so you feel forced into a box not to think of yourself so highly. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low one, of his own talents and character. Some talents, I gather, he really has fixed in his mind the idea that humility consists in trying to believe those talents to be less valuable than he believes them to be. That is, than he really believes them to be. Uh, no doubt they are, in fact, less valuable than he believes, but that's not the point. The great thing is to make him value an opinion for some quality other than truth thus introducing an element of dishonesty and make-believe into the heart of what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. By this method, thousands of humans have been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe they are ugly and clever men trying to believe they are fools. And since what they are trying to believe may in some cases be manifest nonsense, they cannot succeed in believing it. And we have the chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving on themselves in an effort to achieve the impossible. What's the most beautiful thing in all of the virtues is when you find yourself living the virtues without even realizing that you're doing it. There are stereotypes, and maybe uh, you've come across it in books or movies. Those are some of the best ways I know how to um, illustrate some of the points I make sometimes of, of this person who was just such a good person and, but didn't even know that what they were doing was so admirable. You know, someone had to tell them what they were doing was admirable. And it kind of comes as a shock to them. Or maybe in one of these, you know, greatly romantic movies, um, the girl doesn't even know how pretty she is. I mean, she just grows up thinking that she must look like everyone else. She didn't, doesn't know that she is stunningly beautiful until someone comes along and tells her that. 
And there's something about the innocence of her beauty that, you know, enhances her whole being, her whole personhood, her whole personality. He's saying that's exactly, or I'm saying, that's exactly what should be true of all of the Christian virtues in our life. Um, so how do you go about doing that? Because, you know, in setting the virtues, what we're setting is, is what we're supposed to be like, and so it just ends up being a, a study by man of man. A study by man, by a Christian, of what the Christian should be like. And so we find these things that we're supposed to do, and we try to go out and do them. But we're thinking the whole time, this is what I'm supposed to do. And as we're doing it, now I am doing it. And we get through, I was successful in that virtue and what I was supposed to do. And I don't think that that is the successful way that we'll ever be truly successful in doing anything if that's the way we go about it. Uh, so, there's this root of humanism that we have. We are men trying to study of, of the requirements of men, of ourselves. Man spends so much time studying about himself, that's all he can think about is himself and his accomplishments. Or maybe he thinks of the requirements that God has, but it's always the requirements that God has upon him. He's still the focal point here. He's still the point of reference. It's not just God and his virtues, but it's man. He's always so busy studying himself and his history and his future and, and all of this, his current events that he doesn't see God in the whole picture. So we have to somehow end up with um, a more exalted view of God and more of a study of God. I can't think of any way to go about doing it because we still have to be humble whether we remember to do it or don't remember to do it and the latter is the way to do it, don't remember to do it and just do it. We still have to do it one way or the other. These are still not just requirements up in the cosmic heavenlies there, but they're requirements God puts on men below. So men are still involved. So how can I think worse of myself than I really think? Well, I don't think that's the whole point or issue here. I think what the point is, is to somehow practice self-forgetfulness. But since we're always thinking, if we're not thinking about ourselves, we're going to have to have something to think about. There, I think, is where the God-centeredness of our theological education needs to enter the picture. I mean, we need to look, let's take this for an example. Uh, we need to look at history, world history, as God marched through man's land. Too often, don't we just think of history as a lot of illustrious figures in the past, these great men that did such and such. But if we truly have a biblically-centered theological education, then we recognize the sovereignty of God that, yes, God is even ordering all the events of history as well as all the events of the future. That it's not so much man accomplishing various things. It's not so much man did this or man is doing this or man will do this out in the distant future. But my own little definition, world history of God's march through man's land. If we believe in providence and sovereignty and the omnipotence and omnipresence of God like we should, then this is the concept I think that we would end up having. See, if we so exalt God in our understanding, by the way, I don't really intend to finish reading this chapter because I don't agree with all of what Lewis has to say in the rest of the paragraph. That was the best of this chapter. And then he goes on talking about self-love because if you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? And we discussed that nonsense before. I think that falls back in the enemy trap of self-love there. Uh, you're certainly not forgetting yourself when you're busy loving yourself. But I think he's right where he starts off here. It's self-forgetfulness. It's self-forgetfulness. But if we exalt God for who he is and what he is, then it will tend to diminish man that any accomplishment that man has performed and executed will be seen in its proper context, the biblical theological context of God and his rule arcing over all of, quote, man's world history. I mean, the good and the bad has a plan in the arcing world history of God. That world history is God's march through man's land. 
And so what I'm talking about here is a, is a reversal of the way that you think. If you think contextually along this line, then it's going to influence the, the results of everything that we see in our life and everything that is the product of our study. Uh, that's why a theological education that is God-centered and centered on the sovereignty and providence of God is so necessary, but it's so lacking today. And the reason it's so lacking is because of the humanism in the world and what has caused it to continue to be absent today is the humanism in the world. And then what it will produce, that is a lack of a God-centered, a, a theological-centered, a theocentered education. What that will produce then is humanism. It produced the lack, and the lack of it will just continue to further the progress of humanism. As Protagoras said, that man is the measure of all things. That by unaided reason, by scientific inquiry, by empiricism, by nothing but logic and reason, divorced from Scripture, that we can come to you know, a coherent, complete understanding of the world and the universe. And that's not true. Man can never come to grips with a coherent, complete acceptable belief in the world and his existence apart from Jesus Christ. I think what the church needs today is, is a theology of music and worship that is really absent in the church's liturgy today. Um, and what I mean there is I'm getting back on the track of one that is God-centered. Uh, we know that the theological institutions and liturgical churches have somewhat been known for this business of glorifying and exalting God. But it's always absent of any personal piety, though. It's always absent of any um, uh, personal application in those people's lives. And so you go over into the charismatic movement, and one thing that's very alarming from a theological point of view is that so much of the music and so many of the songs are people-centered. The little typical charismatic ditties that are so people-centered and just so frivolous and so light that they tend not to be backed up by Scripture and they tend to um, not deliver, as music and worship should, the proper appreciation of the object of music and worship, which is God himself. You see, I guess a lot of it doesn't even have, they don't even have a certain theology of music or worship. It's just as the Spirit leads us, this is what we're going to do or say. And we have stripped ourselves of some of our earlier songs, and I'm sure there are more that will need to go out uh, the window along the way. But uh, it will take a lot of thought behind it. And I, I'm saying these things tonight here in conclusion. It doesn't only apply to humility, but it applies to all of our study to remember world history as God's march through man's land. That we're trying to come to grips with, with the God of the universe. as we, He's not working on the planet Mars or something. He's working here. So we're trying to come to grips with him, who he is. You know, you know who someone is by what they do. To know who he is, what he's like, by what he's doing in the earth. That it's not just these great men who have accomplished things, and this discovery, and that invention, and this revolution, and that new thought. But it's the unfolding of the mysterious, very mysterious plan of God, of working in a people here and a people there and at this time and that time for we don't know what reason. We're trying to understand what he's doing and why he's doing it and how he has worked in the earth. But you know as well as I do, most education is divorced from any focal point of the existence of God. It's just man has done this and man has done that. Instead of coming to grips with what is being done that's of eternal value through this thought. So back to what Lewis is saying here about self-forgetfulness. Um, I think that is the true end of humility. It's not going to come... I mean, uh, let's look at a few verses here. Uh, Colossians 3 in verse 12. Uh, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, a heart of pity, a kindness, humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. That's humility. Meekness and long-suffering. Um we know that Peter, over in 1 Peter 5, has told us to humble ourselves and God will lift us up. In Romans 12, I believe, Paul speaks again of humility. Several of these notable passages here. Uh, that was 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6.
and then over in Philippians 2. Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, here's what we would probably have to say about, about this, and I'm not saying this is all that can be said about this verse. We certainly don't want to fall into uh, the trap that Lewis warns us, warns us of here in this 14th chapter of screw tape letters, that being we really think ourselves to be better than others, but we're trying to fulfill the biblical injunction here, and so we, in fact, deceive ourselves. We, we, we don't see any other way out of it. We, in fact, think ourselves to be better than others. And yet Paul said, look on others as better than yourself. So how can you do that except to be dishonest with yourself? And it seems like what Paul is saying inv involves more than just self-forgetfulness here. It seems like what Paul is saying involves some type of active process. I think Lewis is certainly right. I think that's, that's the true goal of all of the virtues, it's especially of humility. It's self-forgetfulness. But I don't think that Lewis would even pretend that he's giving us everything about humility there. Uh, Paul said in lowliness of mind, you know, don't forget yourself and forget everyone else, but esteem others better than yourself. And so, probably the only way you can go about fulfilling something like this in an active sense, and in a sense that will be innocent of the charge of self-deceit, is to, in fact, recognize that there will always be something in everyone else that's better than what you have. If you add up the sum total of everything you have as a Christian, you may be better than someone else. But I think that there's always something else in every other person. They're better at something. They have done something better. They've been, if nothing else, more, and this is the greatest thing, more pure and faithful in their motives than you have been. Maybe in their self-forgetfulness about what they've done. There's always something better in someone else that you don't have. I think that's how we can fulfill this. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Paul is just as intelligent as C.S. Lewis. He's not inducing us to self-deceit here. That would be an impossibility for a pretty woman to think that she's ugly. But couldn't she live? Couldn't something happen? I, I'm just suggesting this. Couldn't something happen in her life, in her walk with God, her whole life and her theological education is so God-centered, sovereignty-centered, um, second advent-centered, couldn't something happen in her life so that she tends to forget all about her look? If she's reminded of her look, if he's reminded of his cleverness, well, yes, he's clever. But couldn't something happen in, in, in his life so that he becomes and she becomes self-forgetful in those areas? That's what I'm suggesting. I think that it can happen. I think whenever we are renewing our walk in relationship with Jesus so that our relationship is growing, our relationship with him is growing, not just our knowledge about him, but our relationship with him is growing. And something can happen in our life. It's this episode of self-forgetfulness. So that although we may be doing the right thing, and we are the right thing, and have the right thing, and believe the right thing, we tend to forget about those things. I hope that's not too far off and left mystical field for you. But I know that I have sensed episodes like that in my life. You get so caught up in, in a... Christ-centered, biblically-based theological education that you tend to forget what your accomplishments are. And see, that's, that's not saying that there's not an appropriate time to point to some accomplishment to prove a point. I mean, Paul has various times. Think with me a lot. I thought about this. I thought about it a lot uh, before I came down and shared this message with you here. Well, would it be the best thing to never make any reference to anything you've ever accomplished or anything in your past well, I don't see that being practiced in Scripture. I sometimes see them making a reference because it needs to be made. So, and if that's what we should do, that's what I would like to do, but I don't find the apostles doing that. So. I certainly don't also, on the other hand, find them as uh, so many of these, I'm thinking of one, Hobart Freeman, so many of these teachers out there do, give us the same testimony that they've told over and over and over. If I've heard Hobart Freeman give the story of how they went through college by faith and trusted the Lord, Matthew, if I've heard that once, I've heard it 250 times. 
That's no exaggeration. If I've heard it once, I've heard it 300 times. I, that gets a little old. I just don't see how you could be practicing any biblical virtue in that area because you've never forgotten that. You won't let us forget that. And it, you may need to, to draw attention to that on an occasion. But when I hear the same story 250 times, <laughs> when I hear him tell this story that, well, I preached churches and emptied them, and they, and I asked them, is it because I'm not preaching the Word? They said, no, it's because you are preaching the Word. I mean, that really sounds good about yourself. You got fired because you taught the Word. But I've heard that 150, 175, 200 times, someone's not practicing self-forgetfulness. When I hear Kenneth Hagin relate over and over and over how I was raised up in McKinney, Texas on this day in 1934 as a little boy with chronic heart, then I get tired of that. When I hear over and over, oh, Roberts got healed of tuberculosis and God told him, I'm giving you the message on, I want you to take my healing to your generation. I mean, if I can quote all these guys' testimonies, that means I'm hearing it too often then. <laughs> And that's what that's the whole thing about Roberts. God said, take my healing to your generation. It's printed right there in the prayer tower. Amen. Take my healing to your generation. I mean, the very phrase, you get it memorized because they tell that story over and over and over. All right, that's something I think that is wrong. And if we had a more God-pleasing, God-centered walk and theological education, it all starts up here in the mind, how we're taught and how we think about these things. If we would have more of that, well, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't, it wouldn't enter your mind. It wouldn't enter your mind to keep telling the same testimony over and over again. It would enter your mind on occasion when you have a certain point that you want to prove. Then you think, oh, I remember something. Now I'll prove a point by this. But it's almost like it doesn't even take any prelude. It doesn't even take any introduction for this to pop to your memory. It's just like it's there all the time. You could preach a message on your own testimony here. It doesn't take anything to jar that loose from the cobwebs of the memory of antiquity. It's just, it's there all the time. You're just thinking about, I went by faith to college. I went by faith to college. I never worked an hour. I never worked an hour. I never worked an hour. So that you hear that testimony over and over and over again. There, that's not self-forgetfulness. The person who lives that type of life is, is living pride to its extent. And so it's in vain at least for the person preaching, to preach messages against pride, and all preachers do. They know that's one of the seven deadly sins, pride. To preach messages against that when all you give us is the same testimony over and over and over and over again. So it's not something that we can just start tonight or we started last week. It's uh, it's something that's ongoing and of long standing that will endure for our life. The more we can get God at the center of our education, of our thought pattern, this is what I'm encouraging you to believe tonight and to start living throughout the rest of our life. The more we can get God at the center of our education, then the more self-forgetful we'll be. I think that's just what a knowledge of God does for us. It tends to make you self-forgetful. You're, you're so much into God that, well, number one, if you thought about yourself, there's nothing to compare you and God. So you'd forget about you in a hurry. But number two, you probably won't even think about yourself. Those occasions will pop to your mind when you're maybe trying to prove something about God, not trying to prove something about yourself. And so that means all good deeds of the past. We're supposed to be so forgetful about those things. When, when Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does, I don't think he means that you're to get out a rope and bind the one to oppose and bind the other and then you're sitting there, spread eagle, concentrating. I refuse to let my other hand know what I've done here. Well, you're just blaring it over a loudspeaker to your other hand, if that's our approach to the matter. If that becomes the neatest doctrine that we have, that we don't let our left hand know, do we? We don't let our left hand, we don't let, we don't, well, we're letting everyone's left hand know. Not only our own, but we're blaring it for everyone's left hand to know. Maybe someone whose left hand doesn't know yet because their right hand is quiet. You're telling everyone's left hand whenever that becomes the whole issue here. And the same thing is true with the certain doctrines that we hold when there are these doctrines that are, you know, like we don't do this or don't do that. When that's all it is, that we don't do this and we don't do that, then, you know, you're just caught up in pride over the fact you're obeying Scripture here. Instead of dealing, and this is a chronic error of, of these people that are, are so pride, prideful and self-centered, 
instead of dealing with the passage in context, is that we can hardly wait to get to that because we think that is the context there. And the thing that stands out most in my mind to be non-forgetful about this matter is whenever Dr. Freeman did their series in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it's like chapter 1 existed to give a foundation framework for verse 20 so that we could preach on all the promises, Cadillacs and healing and cars and homes, so that this is the will of God for us. And so every other verse revolved around that one verse. And you could see it so clearly that this was the verse. And so you failed to understand the verse in its context there. That's a critical error and one that's rather chronic, I would say, in the charismatic movement. And I've been reading about it again today in a book that's, that's rather interesting, rather excellent, the way the man is presenting it, of, of lifting out all of these proof texts. Of, they have a certain litany of verses that makes up their charismatic theological liturgy for their certain group. And they don't really know anything about them or what they say or about the context in which they're found. And so I have found myself doing this, and see if you have not experienced the same thing. Reading along in... 2 Corinthians 1, because you know we don't preach about these little verses all the time, and suddenly across verse 20, and kind of thinking, wow, all the promises of God. Has that ever happened to you? It should in a church like this, where those verses are not taught to you all the time. Then you tend to forget those verses are there. You're not quoting them every day, you know. You tend to forget they're there, and you stumble across that. By Jove, this verse is really here. Not just something from Copeland or Hagen. This is really here. Amen. Then you'll appreciate it more. It's God's word to you, not Copeland or Hagen's or Freeman. It's God's word to you then. You're discovering it anew and afresh because you were somewhat forgetful about that passage. And it seems to do more for you then than just you know having it on as, as a bead on a necklace around your neck or something. Good little Jew or Catholic at heart with your favorite verses. <laughs> So we want to uh, divest ourselves from the humanism that's so rampant around us. And the way to do that is to exalt God. If we exalt God, lower man will come to a better appreciation of the truth of God's work. If we exalt all of man's logic and all of man's reason, it's going to damn our own soul. Higher criticism lowers the soul. Higher criticism, because that's an exaltation of man's thinking power that's contrary to God's word. What that will do, it may be higher criticism, but it'll bring your soul lower in spiritual matters. So, let's conclude with that tonight, that self-forgetfulness is the uh, the best proof. Of course, you won't know you got any proof because you won't be noticing it. It's the best proof of these virtues, the best proof of humility.